my van. Oh, nothing like taking over a room after uh, the lunch hour. So hopefully we'll keep this nice and lively. Um, thank you, Lauren, for the introduction. Um, so what I've really gained out of the day is how complex and exhausting this all is as we continue to diversify all of our offerings as companies in the marketplace to compete. Um, so as part of that, you guys, let me know, what are your challenges? Like, what do you see as your number one challenge that you guys face today with the diversification of emerging technologies and platforms and channels of selling? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take the, the first one. I think it's pretty obvious. It's, a, it's been the theme that we've been hitting on, not only today, but um, continuing the, the gap that we have out there. And I think it's, it's the, the, the language or terminology that we have out there where we talk about digital and for us in, in Comcast Spotlight, the television or what it calls classic television um, advertising there. And our biggest challenge as it sits today is how do you bring these things together and how do you bring them together underneath A, a unified inventory set and B, a standardized currency that can be able to yield and manage between these two platforms. That, that A is the number one concern, uh, number one challenge and I would say it's not only getting, not only already started challenge there, but it's getting more challenged because as we've talked through different different groups here is that we're introducing new segmentations and new fragmentation to both of those buckets as we've continued there. Some on the advanced television side, some on the digital side, and we haven't figured out the unification in one of those areas right in the very beginning, and we're adding complexity to it as it goes. Yeah, it just continues to build and build. I mean, we face that every day, even at NBC Universal. And, it, you know, the speaking of the same language, I think that's a really great point. You know, half of the battle is understanding what our counterparts are, are saying and how it relates to our own knowledge base set. So, you know, Bill, tell me, like, what do you guys experience? Yeah, so it's interesting. I think, you know, a lot of what we're talking about is, is trying to, at least the way I feel about it, is that we're trying to influence our television sellers to act more like digital people. And I don't know how many of you guys have television sales teams, but I don't know of any of them that like haven't been in the industry for like 15 years. So it's not like we're pulling people out of college and trying to explain to them something new. They're operating in an established environment that quite honestly operates very efficiently. And they feel like they're being imposed upon to add additional value that quite frankly, we can't prove whether that exists or not. And so there are a ton of technological challenges that we have ahead of us, but I think a lot of the actual, um, you know, kind of personal challenges might even be greater uh, to overcome because, yeah, it's, it's terminology. It is uh, a, a very, you know, accurate way to forecast. You can certainly argue about whether there's an accurate way to report on the performance of campaigns, but um, there, there are certainly a number of challenges sitting ahead of us. Yeah. Um, a great leader once told me it's three buckets, people, process, and technology. Mm -hmm. And those are, I feel, what we face as we continue to fragment the industry more and more, which, you know, is where it's going anyway. Our younger consumers are definitely always wanting to, um, they're the consumers of the connected television devices. They're the ones who are, my nine-year-old swipes through an iPad like it's going out of style. I can't even keep up with her. She's making movies. I'm like, what? Mark, what are you guys Payton's doing? not making movies. <laughs> not quite. She's starring. You can see she's working on her. <laughs> What's it like at Kelly Blue Book? How are you guys facing some of these challenges? I know you just released a new um, Roku part of your business. I heard that in an earlier discussion. So how are you guys handling that operationally? Sure. It, it's you know, for Kelly Blue Book or for Cox Automotive Media, which includes AutoTrader, obviously we don't have some of the challenges that, that we're talking about today. Um, uh, the convergence is a little bit different for us. But we have introduced a, um, a Roku and channel. We're looking to build an automotive channel there. Uh, it was really well received when we launched it, uh, top 10 in lifestyle, but there's still a lot of, it's kind of we're playing with it, we're having some fun with it. But um, uh, I wanted to kind of go back to your first question, since we don't have as much linear and, and, and all the challenges you guys have. Um, you said, what are your top challenges? And there was something Zach said earlier, and I would cede my time to him if he wanted to, but uh, um, his last thing about, yeah, he said, no, um, <laughs> that 30 seconds about um, data and audience. And so I think one of our biggest challenges, similar to what he said, is you know, how are we making sure that we might have it, but how do you really uh, purport the value of that? Make sure that your the advertiser can really be ready for it, understand it, and hope it to help it to make sure that you are getting it, they're going to get a great return on it. Because I'm concerned it's going to become table stakes uh, very quickly, and if that happens, we lose. So, and then the other one is, and I'll just say it for the room, and maybe I'm the only one that thinks this way. Um, programmatic, it's great, awesome. I do not, I do not like the tax. 
Because in a business like ours, you know, an endemic site that is highly sold through, great rates, great CPMs, just the move into programmatic lowers our yield. I mean, we cannot get the returns because of the tax on it. And so there'll become, there will come a point where insourcing and doing this ourselves, I mean, exchanges aren't gonna be a big part of our business. We like the private marketplace and we use that a little bit here and there, but ultimately, you know, whether it's five, seven, 10, 12% uh, of your revenue, our costs aren't that high to do these things ourselves. And I, for one, don't stand, I, I don't wanna stand for us doing that. Now, you might be something that we just turn inward and do it ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. Uh uh, in a previous uh, discussion as well, it was... Yeah! Yeah, yeah. No, no one wants to go live. All right. We'll build it for free. <laughs> well, it's the opportunity cost. Do you take it in-house and you build it, or do you outsource it? Where is that balance? And we get that all the time. So um, I think the convergence balance will be most interesting, right? So we, in the television business, right, as it merges with digital technology, what is the solution? Do you build in-house? Do you do you outsource? There's what are your a, thoughts? Well, and, and, and Mark, just to, I mean, just kind of add on to where, I mean, probably opportunities to kind of look at today. And, and I'm going to go back to you said uh, people, uh, product, process. Process. process, process. I want to say product because technology, <laughs> we have said, I mean, with those, those, those the, the product that we're delivering is really kind of agreeing upon what is it that we have sitting out there. We're so, in, so enamored right now on what the technology is and how that technology is delivering. We're kind of forgetting what we're delivering for a product that's sitting out there. And so I go back to that, those, those three P's that I'm not gonna add the three, third P in there is that it's really about definition of the product and the audience that we're delivering to that product that's sitting on top of that. And now coming back to what you're looking at from programmatic, I mean, we, we've talked internally quite a bit about programmatic and really programmatic from our viewpoint is just automating um, the delivery within that product and that audience across that platform that's there. And one of the challenges that we think we have right now that's it's probably a more of a honeypot than we've, we, we understand or we've been able to leverage as much is that automation of utilizing what we call our long tail or our longer tail inventory inside our linear space today is probably our greatest opportunity. We have a lot of inventory that sits in that space that we're not utilizing because it's missing some of the data attribution, it's missing some of the components that value that inventory, and we now don't have the ability to programmatically buy that or automate that sell of that inventory more effectively. So I think that's one of our opportunities that sit out there, a little bit different obviously from where you're at, but that's our own inventory that we can maximize more effectively without looking at having other people kind of take that in there. So to your answer, answer your question in short, it would be us looking at trying to monetize that more effectively and building that internally with our group. Yeah. I'm gonna add on to, so I, I, I agree with a lot of what you said and I think the thing that, one thing that gets lost a lot is convergence is exciting to talk about, but the, the reason that we're actually looking at doing it is getting to what like Emily was talking about, you know, first thing in the morning, which is the channel agnostic advertising platform. And that's really why we're supposed to do it. I think that, you know, right now I can go out and I can have a seller sell a digital line and a, and a TV line. And, and we do actually, we call it convergent advertising. We have like a separate bucket for that. Um, and, uh, but the reality is like, it's, it's almost like, you know, contracting with a general contractor to do your work on your house. Somebody's gonna do your plumbing and somebody's gonna do your electricity. And that's what happens when it comes inside, it goes out into two disparate systems. It's managed by two different teams. It's reported on in different systems. I, I think, and I'm getting long-winded, but I think the thing that's important when we're talking about convergence is none of us are gonna get in this game to um, generate the same amount of revenue, right? We all talk about, well, if we apply audience to television, we can charge higher CPMs. We can report on it better, we can target more accurately. We need to prove the value back to the advertiser on why, how that's actually more effective. And I don't remember who it was earlier, but you know, it's like, am I actually moving more product off the shelf? That is a huge technological challenge. When we start thinking about things like that, Scripps Networks, we do, we make great shows, we have great brands. We should not try to make that one of our core competencies, I don't think, and I'm speaking out of turn, Todd Overstreet's here, who actually owns this stuff, but, but yeah, no, it's, it's um, I don't know if that should be one of our core competencies, so we're gonna look for, for partners. And then one thing to add on with the tax, Totally agree with you on the programmatic direct stuff. The open exchange, I don't want to manage like 4,000 relationships, so <laughs> I understand there's a tax. But some of these taxes that are starting to be imposed when we're talking about things like programmatic direct are just ridiculous. They're, they're taxes on deals that I could have gone out, gotten myself, and I'm actually paying a higher rate than hiring another trafficker or campaign manager. And that's a real problem. And we're pushing back, and I expect a lot of publishers in this room are gonna push back as well. 
And I do think we have the opportunity to influence their business model to be fair. It's the first time they've tried it, but, um, but yeah, I think there's opportunity for us to fix that. So let's talk a little bit about video itself. You know, um, digital video, uh, long form and short form, how does it really merge for your businesses with your linear cells right now? Um, how do you package and sell those together? Has it been successful for you? Are there stories that you can use or examples of how maybe an upfront deal was constructed or what, you, what are you guys doing to make convergence more of a reality within your cell, sec cell section? We don't, we, um, and somebody mentioned this earlier too, we have, um, we don't necessarily convergently sell video. Well, we do on occasion, but the reality is like television CPMs are a lot lower than digital CPMs. So we actually, as a digital person, try to, try to avoid that. Um, but I think, and I, I really wish I could remember who to give this credit to, you know, I think the place that we are trying to move, um, especially as we're talking about this convergent environment, is one more stop where we stop talking about Best Buy SKUs. Right? We stop talking about a television, we stop talking about a, a tablet, a desktop, a mobile device, whatever, and we just talk about digital video. And again, I can't remember who to give that credit to that. Um, if, I, if you're here, thank you. But, it, but I think that that is, that is a place where we want to go, where we do want to say, you know, this isn't a TV up front, this is a video up front. And these are the audiences you want to reach and these are the places you can reach them. But as it exists today, we actually, we, we sell more uh, like display advertising with TV than we do video. Interesting. From the Comcast perspective. Yeah, yeah. there's, um, I think one of the, I'd, I'd start from a different angle, but I was probably gonna end up in the same space there, is that first off is, we, we say video, but what we've been starting to define is premiumness. What's the premiumness of the video that's there? Which, which is not only hard to define today, um, I think that premiumness of video is going to change in the next, tomorrow, the, a month from now as we go in there. But I think that's where it starts, is that um, we have one, premium video product. It doesn't matter if it's a linear product or if it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter if it's a digital product. And that's how we want to be able to build our audiences around that. And that's really the effort right now. The, the reason why that is important, and one of the points you hit on before, is that, that we believe that that premium video um, is a differentiator. That's the differentiator that we have in our back pocket that we're able to go out and present that, um, that creating demand and really creating the emotional connection to the brand that exists inside of that. Um, so what we are currently doing is, and, and it is the, 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 the analogy of the house, we have two separate sides at this point, but we continue to build and continue to be focused on how do we, how do we deliver audience across both of those. So it's not looked at as a different device, it's not looked at as a different product, it's part of that unification and that premium video that's there. The tough thing I think we're going to have to work on is what, what now becomes premium and what's not premium? Because we are starved in that space of, we, we believe there's quite a bit of premium video in obviously the linear side. But as we start to get into that long form, short form on what I'd say is more traditional digital business, that is the limited amount of inventory that we have today. And so as we try to incorporate that and try to grab those audiences from all these different products that are out there, that's gonna be one of our challenges to make sure that we don't pull in any type of uh, uh, inventory into that premium video pool that all of a sudden is no longer as classified as premiumness in the, in the marketplace and essentially devaluing our larger product that's out there. Absolutely. Surprisingly, I have, I have no comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> that a big problem for us. Yeah. Right, well, so while we go out and we sell the one line, in terms of a delivery, um, there are still quite a few platforms out there that don't support uh, basic implementation of third-party ad tags, specifically in set-top box. So how are you handling those challenges from an insertion order perspective? Is it truly one line? Um, how oftentimes do you try and marry the concept of one line to what actually needs to happen in the ad server for delivery? Where, where's the balance there? You want to take this one? Okay. Well, well I have no question, set, gentlemen. I'm not really oh, worried yeah, about yeah, the yeah, set-top yeah, box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, for, yeah, for us, yeah. obviously, in digital, not much of, a, yeah. not much yeah. of an issue. Yeah. We manage it in separate lines. Separate lines. Yep. From a mobile perspective, are you also doing the same, or have you guys gotten to the point where you know, the, the one line is agnostic for at least desktop and mobile? For, for digital, we are, we, for digital, yes, we can do that. We can consolidate into a single line, but when we start getting into devices that you're mentioning, like, yeah, that's when we have to actually break out separate line items and separate pricing. And, Absolutely. Yep. So let's talk a little bit about VOD and DAI. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Your sweet spot. We'll get, we'll, 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 we'll whiteboard it. We'll, Mark will help us with whiteboarding, the yield curves of Kelly Blue Book. So um, specifically, 
those two channels, are they generating um, incrementally more revenue? Where do you see those growth trends going in, in the future as people are consuming more um, after that C3 window completes? Yeah, so specifically hit on, on the DAI piece of this that's there is it, I think it's, you're gonna hear the same thing over and over. It's, it's all about an audience that we're delivering within that premium video space that's sitting out there and obviously incorporating uh, VOD DAI is, is an additional inventory pool that should be incorporated into that space that's there. And um, our, I mean, our, our current efforts right now is, I mean, is, is limited to the amount of programming inventory that we have sitting out there. But that is absolutely our efforts to be able to bring that in. In, in so many ways, I mean, you look at, and I mentioned, a, I said the word honeypot earlier, of, of, of opportunity that sits in our spotlight or linear video that's sitting out there. One is I think there's still, there's still opportunity in our traditional classic uh, video that's sitting out there. But the easiest transition for a buyer, for a, an advertiser, for our sellers that are sitting out there is VOD. Um, VOD DI is there, it's, it's, it's pre the premiumness tag sits on it. It's got programming um, uh, uh, content that's sitting associated to it. And it's an easier transition than trying to transition to, let's say, display advertising or any type of other um, advertising component that you would be bolting on. So there's a lot of energy in that space and I think that's probably one of our greatest opportunities to be able to pull more into that. The, the big thing is the limitation that sits out there, is how much of that inventory can we get and how quickly can we get that to be able to bring it part and bring it into the larger spectrum. One other point that, and this is much more of a spotlight type of a, of a comment here, but not only are we looking at national footprint type of capabilities, but we also have a long, I mean, a, a very large uh, sales staff that's really targeted for a regional or national business that's out there. And so, although that's a, it's great to have the feet on the street to be able to engage with our advertisers at that point, it also presents a limitation when you start geographically segmenting the amount of inventory that we have sitting out there. And so that's a limitation that we have to be able to scale ourselves to where we need to, is once you start getting into smaller geographic areas and out audiences that sit over the top of them, um, that is gonna be the, uh, the limitation for the inventory piece. So. Yeah, no, VOD's been one of our nicest surprises over the last two years. I mean, it's, it's um, we've seen substantial growth um, in the amount of available inventory. Uh, we're a publisher that sells through um, um, at very high rates on our digital video inventory. And you know, like you said, um, it's a pretty easy transition so that as we're beginning to sell out, we begin, we begin to open up the uh, VOD inventory. So it's been very positive for us and we don't see any real signs of that slowing down. That's great. So we'll move away from video, engage Mark a little bit more since I know Kelly. A little better. Kelly okay. Blue Book is a little, uh, a non, non-video heavy site, but. Well, well, very heavy in video, but not linear. And so, not, yeah. uh, you know, we have a, a great inventory of video. One of the reasons we started the Roku channel and we're doing a lot more to surface it and we get a lot of traffic uh, to a video. So we do have, uh, it's monetized, but I would say we're still in the infancy of how, how much we can do with it. So let's talk about what your current composition is right now in terms of your site. How many channels are you going through? How many sales channels are you actually going through? Programmatic, programmatic direct, um, ad exchanges. Where do you see the balance of percentage across those um, yield opportunities? I'll take this one first, gentlemen. <laughs> Go ahead. So, uh, and, and I'll speak for Cox Automotive Media again, Auto Trader and Kelly to combine. I think we're we're 95 to 97 percent direct, and uh, our, our, our uh, opportunities that we have right now in the, in the programmatic space, there's some exchange, open open type exchange that uh, we partake in, but mostly it's private deals and looking for opportunities for near endemic. Uh, advertisers outside um, outside of the manufacturers to be able to, to buy our inventory and then obviously see what the return is on that inventory to help turn them into a direct buy. And it's, that's actually been working pretty well and help us drive some incremental revenue uh, opportunities and develop relationships once we get them into the, into the direct side. So right now I look at it, while the revenue is great, I really look at it as a cost of doing business to help further other uh, relationships. Um, you know, fast forward five years, a lot of it depends on the partners and the, and the vendors in the space and how much we want to do ourselves because I still expect us to be a very highly sold uh, direct uh, just because of the relationships and the, the finite number of customers that we really work with uh, in, uh, in the endemic space. Um, but I do, I do want to take more advantage of programmatic direct or automated guarantee, things where it would make sense to help but not at the fees that, uh, that are out there right now. Um, I also do expect that you know, we'll, we would probably never really be actively, that actively involved in open auction 
but private marketplace, as we start to get our manufacturers more comfortable with it, for endemic sites and obviously our sales teams, because a big challenge is how do you incent your sales team if they still have the direct relationship with um, uh, to, to let them let go and put some things in the private marketplace? Because you know the Forge uh, Cadillacs and such of the world, they're going to want to be able to do some things a little bit differently and ha experiment a little bit, and we want to make sure that we're prepared for that. It's not going to be you know, hey, we have a great relationship, but no, you can only buy it this way. We want to be able to play in that space and be there with them, but only when it makes sense for both of us. And to date, it's been, uh, it hasn't. And so they've been very comfortable staying direct. But uh, I do see in the next five years that that will grow. But um, I'm still, I would still think that more than 90% of our revenue would come from direct five years out. Yeah. Definitely, I, I feel like direct will still drive the majority of the revenue that comes in, but it'll be really interesting to see where our businesses find gap areas to continue to grow. So do you guys have any gap areas that you guys are working to identify or have identified where you're helping to increase the yield um, in that particular channel today? At a platform level or just, just generally? Just generally. generally. Yeah. Well, uh, so we're, we're um, I wish we had those self-through rates. We're like, um, <laughs> uh, direct sales probably consumes about um, I don't know, call it 60% of our impressions and then 40% is programmatic. But if you look at revenue, it's like 80% goes to direct and 20% goes to programmatic. So um, I think there are two things that we're trying to do. You know, on the, on, the, on the high end, when we look at the high CPMs, we're investing a lot actually, and we're all talking about automation. We're investing a lot in the stuff that's totally not automated. So a lot of like the content or uh, marketing or, or branded entertainment efforts, a lot of the big custom never been done before stuff, because while the cost is, is great, there's a ton of revenue associated with those things, especially if you work for you know, a brand like Food Network and you have so many endemic advertisers that you can associate with. On the other end, though, what we're trying to do is apply as much demand against that 40% as possible to kind of squeeze the middle. Because what we found is that when we, when we, um, when we, when we push those CPMs up, it allows us um, more strength in our um, ability to negotiate rate cards. And so what we're actually trying to do is put pressure on both sides to have the middle increase. And so you get like, oh, you get more um, big dollar high CPM stuff, you get higher CPM stuff on your low end, and it helps you push up the middle. Okay. So that's kind of how we're trying to fill those gaps. Travis, any gaps on your area yeah. that you guys have named? I mean, it's uh, probably similar. The, the percentages that are definitely different there is, I mean, we are, we're predominantly direct. I mean, we have a very large sales staff that obviously, I mean, we have a, a large emphasis on making sure we have that direct relationship there. So there's a very small percentage. But where, where I think there's, there's an opportunity that's very similar in what we have in there is that we, have, we still have undervalued or undersold inventory on our linear side, um, which there, it does exist that's sitting out there. And the main, the main reason for that is not because we don't have sales folks out there or we don't have the demand for it. It's how we're measuring that, um, that, that inventory that's going undersold or undervalued in there. And so there's really two components to this. Is one is you got to get, we talk about the, the data component um, in many of these sessions that are there. We've got to start creating that value against the, um, uh, th that, that long tail inventory that's sitting out there. And then the second thing is, is that how do you now utilize that inventory more effectively to drive that yield up? And so it's, it's, it, we, we see definitely a longer term vision of not only having really is kind of this mixture, this hybrid of being able to kind of convert a little bit of our linear business, much of that, that undersold, undervalued inventory to much more of a, we'll call it automated or programmatic sell in there to be able to increase that yield. But that should be able to put that same pressure um, on our direct sales to be able to increase some of the yield on some of our OTO or some of our prime programming that we have out there today. So. I do want to add one point on the gap, uh, going back to what Zach said. I think where we're, we're starting to invest more in is on the monetizing audience the best way possible and any better way tailored with what Kevin said also earlier um, providing the insights that go along with it and with, for the part when you've got a smaller group of, of advertisers that you're working with you can afford to go a lot deeper than maybe what you were talking about in sourcing that we can afford to go do those things because you know uh, 60 70 65 to 70 percent of, uh, of shoppers are going to come to one of our sites if not both of our site during the buying process and there's a lot of great information there and we don't want it to become table stakes and so we want to make sure we're doing the right job to challenge what any other third party is saying about how how much lift how much is this changing whether it be uh, visits to a dealership or actual uh, uh, inventory being sold at a dealership or from a from a brand perspective what kind of interaction are you getting how many loyalists are coming back and really buying that second car or the third car and we have the capabilities I mean especially Kelly I look at it and I mean we're 90 years old this year at Kelly Blue Book and, and values are at our core 
we have a giant team of data scientists. This is all the heck they do, is study data. So we can definitely afford to leverage and lean in to try to do audience the right way. Amazing. Well, we have exactly 30 seconds left. I promised Rachel I would be on time. Um, oh. <laughs> So. Uh, yes, so the whiteboards are empty. Would you like some um, audience engagement with uh, talking about yield curves and current challenges that you guys are dealing with today? So I uh, kind of open it up to the audience to talk about uh, what are you guys facing? Um, how does your yield curve actually look today? And where are your pockets of exposed inventory or your growth opportunities? 